Hello, welcome to the latest installment of the Mediterranean Seminar podcast. Let's talk Mediterranean. <laughs> and uh, today, uh, Sharon Kinoshina, myself, Brian Katlas, co-directors of the Mediterranean Seminar, have the great pleasure of having as our guest, Martin Devica, uh, and he is an assistant professor of literature who teaches in the classics program at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He received his PhD from Yale in classics and comparative literature in 2012, and his first book, Broken Cities, came out in September of this year. And it is in fact to talk about Broken Cities that we're here today because the Athens chapter, chapter one, from Broken Cities, a historical sociology of ruins, published by Johns Hopkins, uh, was selected as the Mediterranean Seminar's December 2020 article, or in this case, chapter of the month. And so uh, we've got Martin here. We're going to talk a little bit about the chapter and about his work and about other related Mediterranean historical and classical topics. And with that, I'll turn things over to Sharon. So Martin, this is um, a departure for us because in the short span of our article of the month um, run, yours is the first book chapter to be selected. So let me just introduce, um, as Brian said, your new book, Broken Cities, A Historical Sociology of Ruins. So this is a book in four chapters. Um, and the first chapter, which is our article of the month, is on Athens. But before we start, I wonder if you could give us a little background. What first drew you to the idea of ruins and ruination? Well, I think that um, the genesis of the project is really twofold. There's one kind of, um, I guess, moment of experience that I had while um, exploring uh, Roman and pre-Roman ruins in Italy and looking at these things um, and thinking, um, well, the fact that they're kind of decayed and fallen down buildings uh, signifies something very clearly to me, um, but their ability to, to signify in that way is the result of this kind of accumulated cultural legacy of uh, archeology span and such that uh, leads us to see ruins as kind of indexes to the past, as fundamentally reconstructible, um, as signs that the past is past. Um, but basically as being related to us in the way that an instrument of knowledge uh, would be related to a, a, a certain field of science. Um, so there was that, that was the thing that got me thinking about ruins, but I've also um, for a long time been kind of interested in uh, the problem of antiquarianism um, and the antiquarianisms of the past and the way that um, pre-modern cultures think about their own past, conceptualize their own past, uh, um, I think in ways that could become useful to us in the same way that, for instance, Eduardo Viveros de Castro talks about uh, turning the theory of the other into a form of philosophy. Uh, so I think about these antiquarians of the past uh, and their, their views of their own past as potentially uh, informing a, a new archaeology for um, us living now. And ruins was for me a way into that, um, uh, a way of connecting the problem of the past of the past with uh, certain material cultural uh, artifacts and uh, a discourse surrounding them. So uh, a way of getting into those problems a little more concretely. Great. Now, Martin is my um, colleague in literature at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and Martin came to us as the result of um, a position which was meant to be a classical position, but it was um, classics or antiquity and Mediterranean studies. So obviously the breadth of Martin's work um, immediately called to us, but Martin, of all of the areas that we work in in Mediterranean studies, I think classics is the um, field or the, the time period, um, which w already, um, you know, Mediterranean is in fairly common use as a way to delineate that field. So I wonder if you could just um, talk us through a bit 
how your Mediterranean, and obviously your book expands well beyond the Mediterranean as well, but how that, how you think your approach to ruins or other aspects of um, classical culture maybe uses the Mediterranean in a different way than um, might be traditional to the field? Would that be fair to say? Uh, yeah, well, I think so. Um, I guess that I'm, I'm working with, uh, in Broken Cities, I'm working with a kind of a broken sea or multiple Mediterraneans in the way that you know, Horton and Purcell talk about it in the corrupting sea. The, the ocean is not coming together as, as one coherent unit necessarily. Um, but in the first three chapters, I guess, which do have a, a kind of a strong Mediterranean accent, um, the, the sort of lesson that comes out of those, I guess, about the Mediterranean is that it's a, a field for constructing concepts. The, the concept of ruins that the Greeks or the Romans or um, in, a, in a broader sense, um, medieval Muslims kind of have and work with uh, is one that is built on the back of kind of trans-Mediterranean comparisons and movements across the Mediterranean. Right? So when the Greeks are talking about permanent ruination, this is one of the things that uh, I sort of discovered in the course of working on the chapter that uh, is the subject of, of the interview. They're not talking about ruins necessarily as artifacts in Greece, because those don't really exist. Uh, they're talking about ruins at the other end of the Mediterranean in the Black Sea. They're talking about ruins in Egypt. They're talking about ruins in, um, in the Near East. Um, so in that sense, the concept of ruination for the Greeks is this very kind of uh, trans-Mediterranean comparative one. Um, but also, and this is true of, of Romans as well, um, ruins have a place in these kinds of trans-Mediterranean narratives. So there's this story of ruins as revenge um, that is constructed a little bit after the fact, but, but belongs to a, a, the language of the time as well, uh, where the Greeks make the first ruin in the series of ruins by um, sacking Sardis. Uh, Athens is supporting the rebellion of uh, a series of, of uh, linguistically and ethnically Greek states that have um, been sort of rolled up in the Persian empire. Um, around 600 BC, just to give people some, some chronological uh, tent poles here. Um, in the course of this revolution or rebellion, which turns out to be unsuccessful, the Ionians and their Athenian allies burn down Sardis, um, destroying uh, Sardis's public and private buildings. This ruination uh, becomes something that the um, Persian emperors, a series of them, feel really compelled to try and avenge, um, at least in Herodotus's narrative. Uh, his history of, of the Persian Wars. One of the big reasons that the Persians go after Greece is exactly this ruination, the desire to, to, to uh, avenge it. Uh, and they do eventually in 480 and 479 BCE, um, the Persians reach Athens, a city that has been largely abandoned at this point by the population of, of the city have moved off to, to Salamis. Um, and the Persians do uh, sack and burn it in stages. Uh, as a form of revenge, it's flagged as that in Herodotus's narrative too. Now then the third term in this, this uh, story involves Alexander the Great going back to Persia and eventually um, burning down Persepolis um, in revenge for the, the ruination of Athens. Uh, so there's also this kind of way in which ruins link together various places in the Mediterranean, motivate movement across the Mediterranean, um, and for the Greeks become this kind of key term in talking about um, empire, empire making, the justice of empire making. Um, 
that that, that um, Mediterranean that they're kind of moving across uh, conceptually there is, is an imaginary Mediterranean that, that is useful for Greeks for thinking through ruins. So do you see this as, as you're talking about the, the, the desire to uh, Im impose or inflict ruination as a sort of motivating factor in, in, in these policies? Do, do you see it as, a, as really something that's motivating them or is it sort of a, a, a framework for, for you know, rationalizing or understanding or legitimizing kind of things that they were gonna do anyways? You know what I'm saying? Is this yeah. a, sort of a posterior rationalization of, uh, you know, uh, good old empire building, or, you know, is it really something which is, uh, uh, you know, genuinely pushing them along? So it's, it's difficult to uh, get behind Herodotus because he's kind of the only source for a lot of this stuff. But if we're talking about Alexander the Great, then I think that uh, you've hit the nail on the head there. Uh, it is a form of rationalization that, however, also seems to belong to propaganda that the Macedonians are circulating and their allies in, in Athens are circulating before they invade Persia. Uh, so it's, it's part of the kind of programmatics of Alexander's empire building. Um, it's a way of justifying it, but it's also a way of, of enabling it to happen by, by uh, getting the consent of the various other poles in Greece to, to go along with this project. Uh, by asking people to think about it in terms of revenge for what the Persians have done to Greece and Athens in particular. It's interesting because it, it seems to me that that sort of dynamic can only kind of take place or is more prone to take place when people see themselves as working within the same sort of uh, cultural system as it were. Uh, there's a certain in engaging in that sort of tit for tat, or uh, I guess it's more than a tit for tat if you're destroying cities, but that sort of cycle sort of Im Im implies a sort of recognition of the legitimacy of the other party and a recognition of the fact that you're kind of both working within the same socio-political and cultural system. Is that fair to say? I mean, I think that the, it's, it's fair to say that um... Herodotus does represent the um, Greeks and Persians as, as uh, working within the same cultural system to the extent that they both understand ruin and ru ruins and ruination in this very kind of similar way. Um, that is a projection on the part of Herodotus, probably the later uh, Macedonian propagandists as well, and a useful one in terms of um, making out the, these ruins to become, to, to be a kind of a, an intentional insult or a particular kind of uh, civic harm, which the Greeks are supposed to want to avenge. But um, something that I've been getting into a little bit more lately is looking at this from the Persian side, um, where there is a, a, a certain amount of evidence, although it's much later. Um, if you look at the account of the coming of Alexander in uh, the Artoviras, for instance, a Middle Persian um, kind of proto divine comedy thing, a uh, trip to the afterlife, but uh, it starts by describing how um, Alexander came to Persia and made all of these ruins. But there, the ruination is conceived of as a disaster because of the loss of access to texts, which it creates. Uh, it's blamed for the, the loss of access to the earlier and much more copious um, Zendavesta writings, which uh, were, were, were preserved in part, but not in whole. And um, so this produces a kind of uncertainty about what's right and wrong when it comes to religion. Uh, and it's not really conceived of as a, as a matter for revenge there, or like a deliberate insult in this kind of um, longer tit for tat, as you were saying. So I, I do see this as really a particularly like Greek approach to uh, ruins, which is getting projected onto the Persians. It's maybe not that surprising to think of this discourse of ruination or actual ruination in, um, for 
in the example you've been talking about the relationship between the Greeks and the Persians, but your chapter also has some interesting things to say about ruins within the um, Hellenic world. I wonder if you could spell that out a little bit. So there's this uh, kind of a paradox at the heart of uh, figuring out how ruins work in Greece, which I've gestured towards a little bit, which is that Greeks talk about ruins a lot, but they don't, they don't really exist in Greece. Uh, that is to say, long-term ruins of the sort that we think of when we hear the word ruins don't um, happen among Greek cities. Um, cities get depopulated or sacked with some, frequent, some frequency, but um, you know, they then get repopulated in, in not too long. Um, and this is, I think, just because of the way that the uh, Greek-speaking world is kind of set up politically. That um, It's polycephalous. There are multiple centers of power. Nobody really has the excess of power that would be required to keep a place ruined for a long period of time, to produce an actual ruined city where it's been empty for so long that the buildings are falling apart. Uh, and you get this kind of stereotypical view of a city with roofs falling in and that kind of thing. Um, or reduced to its foundations, which is the uh, kind of Greek expression for this that shows up in, in uh, Thucydides and a few other authors. The exceptions to that rule, that you can't really have ruins in Greece, are themselves kind of revealing. Uh, they are in places like the Peloponnese, where uh, Sparta actually does build this kind of a territorial state and produces a supply of helots for itself by uh, destroying and ruining um, other rival poles that, that um, are in the Peloponnese. Um, or in um, Sicily, for instance, which is also a place where, where uh, Greek-speaking people build territorial states, um, putting large areas of territory under the domination of one, one polis. Um, but by and large, ruins are this kind of term in, in, in discourse, which doesn't exist really, which isn't to say that you can't use them to scare people, which is how uh, they come to be a kind of effective representation. Um, I say in the chapter that ruins uh, have a kind of democratic association, I would say, before the Peloponnesian War, but because of the way in which uh, Athens tries to ruin other cities during that war and then um, comes pretty close itself to being ruined, depopulated, rendered anastatos is the Greek word, um, at the end of the, the Peloponnesian War, uh, ruins kind of change valence. Suddenly there are these, uh, it's a specter that gets summoned up by conservative um, political speakers, people like Isocrates, for instance, or, or Phocion, uh, to say, hey, if you act too democratically, or if you act too ambitiously in terms of your, your foreign policy, uh, ruination is the hazard that, that you, um, you face. So you should accept this kind of moderate, uh, oligarchically inclined um, direction to, to foreign and domestic policy that, that we're suggesting. Can you explain a bit that connection between ruins and democracy that you uh, alluded to? Uh, I see this as being, say, a particular literary figure in um, Herodotus, but one that's also uh, supported to an extent by the archaeological record at Athens, um, where, as he recounts it, when the Persians reach Athens, most of the people have fled already. They've uh, gone off with the Athenian navy. Some people stick around to defend the city, but they end up being uh, massacred. When the Persians ruin Athens, the way that they ruin it is first to destroy all the big public architecture, destroy the Parthenon, all the things that um, we sort of associate with the city of Athens today are built after the, the, the Persian invasion because the, the original buildings, the original temples uh, all got destroyed. They do not destroy the Areopagus. Um, the Areopagus is 
uh, taken by Herodotus to be, and by, by a lot of contemporary writers, to be a symbol of kind of oligarchic, older style, restricted democracy. The Areopagus is a um, particular panel of judges for deci deciding uh, judicial and at an earlier stage political issues, which is, uh, is constituted out of uh, noblemen, basically. Um, so the decision of the Persians to preserve that Areopagus and destroy all the other public architecture is a way of, of saying, hey, we're creating an oligarchic city. And they bring in these Athenian oligarchic and tyrannical exiles um, from various earlier, earlier stages of, of uh, Athens kind of governmental history to make sacrifices on the Areopagus. As though to say, well, by destroying all the, the public monuments of Athens, we've created a kind of a, an oligarchic privatized city. And the private houses are also preserved at this stage. Though as the, the um, invasion of Greece goes on, um, those structures are also um, destroyed by the Persians as they retreat. Uh, so while this ruination is happening, the demos of Athens has kind of become uh, a nomad demos. Um, the people of Athens has become uh, nomads. This is something that um, Herodotian scholars have talked about. Uh, it seems as though the Athenians are adopting uh, a Scythian tactic for avoiding um, invaders, which is to, to leave your city behind and go off and just wander about. Um, the narrative frame that this follows, though, actually in, in Herodotus, if you look at the way the narrative progresses, um, is that of a colonization where um, people from a Greek metropolis go off to found a new city somewhere else. There are various islands that they stop at on the way, various kind of uh, anecdotes that happen uh, so as to produce a new city and a new people from this, uh, this section of the metropolis that broke off. Um, there are many, many of these narratives in Herodotus. The one that I chose to, to parallel with uh, the Athenian story in my book is, is the foundation of Cyrene, which even actually features some of the same island names in the story. Um, but so in terms of the headline event that kind of makes the Athenian people new over this, the course of this colonization narrative, that's the Battle of Salamis, where they, um, alongside other Greeks and their fleets, destroy the um, bulk of, of the Persian navy. Um, one of the kind of big contributions to the defeat of the Persian invasion, Herodotus says it's the most important one. Um, and so then following that and following the Battle of Plataea that eventually um, prompts the Persians to start retreating from, um, from Greece, the, Athens, the Athenians resettle their own city and uh, rebuild it uh, along more democratic lines, right? Because the only thing that's left is this kind of Areopagus, this monument to the oligarchy. Uh, well, they refound it as a... Um, broader democracy even than um, before in the history of the, the sixth century in Athenian politics is the, uh, the history of people belonging to the kind of naval classes uh, seeming to get kind of more political representation. So the democracy becoming broader, the uh, reduction of the power of the Areopagus even further. Um, and then finally, the uh, rebuilding of all of that democratic monumental architecture, public architecture that was destroyed by the Persians on a much grander scale. So you get a, a bigger Parthenon, you get um, a, a better Pnyx, all these buildings that um, had been wrecked now reappear as, as monuments uh, to Pericles, sure, but also uh, Pericles being the sort of um, dominant figure in the Athenian political scene at this, at this, this time, but also um, monuments to the Athenian people, so public uh, possessions, public property and public monuments. So pulling back from, uh, from Athens and maybe even, uh, this is something you talk about in, in other parts of your book, uh, the ruins that it seems that you're mostly talking about in chapter one are either ruins that you make 
or that uh, others make of your stuff, which is mm -hmm. to say ruins that are in the sort of recent, uh, what we might call the living historical memory, right? And so they might have this immediate kind of exemplary or, or political uh, signification. Uh, I'm also wondering though, because uh, I guess not all ruins, it would be fair to say, are alike. You have those other ruins, which are the ruins you find, uh, mm -hmm. you know, vestiges of, of uh, older civilizations uh, of the type that maybe the Greeks aren't really prone to encounter except in a place like Egypt or Persia, which has a longer tradition of sort of, uh, you know, monumental architecture. And I'm just wondering if you if you deal with those in your book and and what do the way that uh, different cultures and societies approach these uh, you know remnants of what appears to be a grandiose and you know probably superior past how do they wrestle with that and what does it tell us about their sense of their place in uh, you know history in in, mm. in, in, in providence and, and and so on. How do they grapple with it? You know, is it is it, ev yeah. is, 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 is it a trophy that they've uh, succeeded these magnificent civilizations or does it speak to a, 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 you know, a kind of temporal decline kind of thing, a corruption? Well, so it's a real complicated question with respect to the Greeks because uh, with the exception of some traces of Messini, uh, the Homeric Greek city, which people think they can identify uh, as you said, there's not a lot of that in Greece to be talking about. Um, definitely Thucydides, when he talks about Mycenae, doesn't think that um, it's a, a monument of, of a superior past. When the Greeks do encounter that kind of thing, um, I'm thinking of sort of an interesting case from Xenophon's Anabasis, the story of, of his uh, mercenary service in Persian civil war, and then eventually his trying to like, get out of Persia when, when the side he was uh, helping out loses. Um, they encounter the ruins of, I think people think it's Nineveh. Uh, he calls it Larissa, but it's, a, it's not a Greek city. It's in, um, it's in Mesopotamia. And they're very big ruins, but he kind of treats them as a matter of a uh, practical matter, a thing that you can use to shelter yourself. He's not looking at these as, as imposing monuments of the past, because I don't think that fundamentally the Greek attitude towards ruins is particularly past oriented. Um, it is uh, by and large very present, even future oriented because of the way that they, they um, encounter and experience ruination as something that, that is um, the passing, a phenomenon of, of, of the moment, not something that lasts. But the, the sort of situation you describe, I think, fits much more closely to the way that um, medieval Islamic onlookers view ruins of the classical past. Um, as something that's midway between uh, a monument to the insuperable superiority of the past and a kind of a trophy, definitely is as an object of rivalry. Um, and I talk about this in, in a lot of detail in the third chapter of my book, which is about uh, medieval Islam. Um, but Ibn Khaldun, who I talk about in that chapter, um, has this whole kind of long discussion of ruins in, in the Muqaddimah. Um, where he talks about them, yes, as, as index to the failure of the Arabs to build long lasting dynasties. Um, he says, well, uh, the popular story is that these ruins in North Africa were built by giants, but actually they were built by normal people who built like very long lasting and stable states. And um, Ibn Khaldun then turns that kind of critique against um, contemporary Islamic dynasties for their kind of uh, failure to survive the, the, the putative th three generations which a dynasty lasts in, in Ibn Khaldun's uh, scheme. Um, but this way of addressing ruins is one that's written kind of deeply into uh, Islamic historiography. There are all sorts of um, stories of spoliation in which a um, monarch 
a, a caliph uh, tries to take rocks from a particularly imposing ruin and finds that they can't really do it either because there are just too many rocks there or because there's some sort of uh, curse on the structure, uh, bad things start happening. Um, and the vizier is like, well, I told you not to start tearing this thing down. Now you, you've started to do it and you can't finish it and you look weak by comparison to the past. Um, and the, in one of these episodes actually that features um, the Caliph al-Mamun, uh, the vizier says, yes, you should, take, you should treat this ruin, which is of a Persian palace at Ktesiphon, the, the Sasanian capital. You should treat this ruin as a trophy uh, and rewrite it into a kind of Islamic history because there's a prayer site where, where the Imam Ali uh, went to pray in there. So it's part of, it's part of your history now make it a trophy. Uh, the alternation between these two attitudes, I think, is, is really definitive for um, the Islamic discourse on ruins um, in the medieval period, uh, which is really comp complicated and actually leads to a lot of kind of fictions about ruins, which are kind of fascinating to read, stuff like the, the City of Brass, um, which is not something that you really see in, in the literary record of earlier periods. Or, or you have the, the Tower of Hercules in uh, Toledo, which is uh, connected with the uh, Arabic conquest of, of Al-Andalus. But I'm, I'm glad you brought up Spolia because actually uh, in a previous episode, we were speaking with the art historian Karen Matthews, who looks at, at Spolia in the medieval Mediterranean on the, on the Christian side. And this, mm -hmm. this incorporation of, uh, of elements of not necessarily old, but often older structures into, uh, into newer ones, uh, uh, columns, uh, you know, bits of ceramic, uh, bits of statue. And yeah, I guess the, the, uh, uh, in the Islamic period, this was really big, the recycling of, of, of classical bits of statue or old sarcophagi and, and, and stuff like that. But, mm -hmm. uh, you don't really see that happening in the, in, in the earlier period with the Greeks, no? Uh, I, it does not seem to me that there's an awful lot of uh, spoliation in the world of, of Greek architecture, although I'm not actually an archaeologist or architectural historian, so I'm sure that uh, somebody will, will tell me that I'm wrong. Um, there is a certain amount of, you could say, self-spoliation. For instance, in Athens, the uh, portions of the old Parthenon, the ones that, one that the Persians had destroyed, are used in the building of the new Parthenon. And there's a debate that goes on about how to understand that, that spoliation and reuse uh, for lack of any explicit commentary in the ancient sources. Um, Romans are, of course, all about it in, in the sense that uh, the expansion of their empire is also like history's first great art theft. Um, all sorts of columns and statuary uh, get separated from their architectural settings and, and in a way even turned into works of art just because they're, they're decontextualized um, in that way and taken back to Rome. Um, at a, a later period, certainly too, in late antiquity, um, spoliation becomes a much bigger deal because you do start to have these abandoned buildings that are falling down and because um, a lot of the major sources for um, prestige marbles just aren't shipping to Rome anymore. Um, for the Romans, it doesn't seem to be so much a matter for anxiety or rivalry, rivalry with the past as um, for the most part, a matter of kind of practical concern. Uh, there are places, are cases where spoliation does seem to have a, a strong political or religious method, message. Um, this wave of, of art import from Greece, for instance, when Rome become, becomes kind of a hegemon in the Mediterranean. Uh, later on in the building of Constantinople, um, the movement of certain pre-Christian works of art to Constantinople as a way of um, emphasizing the kind of uh, dominance of that city and giving it a, an, an ancient history, which it sort of lacks um, in and of itself. But 
that spoliation is mostly just a, a matter of kind of day-to-day -day practice, I think, in, in the late antique Roman world. So one thing that grabbed me in your book, and I think it was in the Athens chapter, um, was that you mentioned that um, natural disasters did not make ruins. So there might be an earthquake or a volcano, but whatever destruction resulted from that was, was just conceptually separate, distinct from um, ruination in the way that you've been talking about it. Am I remembering correctly? Yeah, more or less. Um, what I guess I'm saying there in kind of the broader context of the book is that these natural disasters are not sufficient to make ruins, though uh, they are often remembered in kind of the later historical record as being responsible for ruins. Um, thinking, I don't know, for instance, of, of uh, Jerash, this uh, old Hellenic city in, in uh, Jordan, um, sort of gets depopulated in the Middle Ages after a big earthquake in the eighth century, the continuous population center from the Hellenistic period through um, the early Islamic period. Um, that the reason that it is able to become depopulated because of that natural, natural disaster rather than being rebuilt is that it's kind of economic centrality is fading. It's not really, um, there anymore. There is no reason for there to be a city at that site um, after the 8th century. Something similar happens with this kind of series of cities in Iraq that I talk about in, in chapter 3 of my book. Um, the process of ruination of a city has more to do with its centrality and kind of a network understanding of um, urban sites in a region than it does with particular events. Now, not even talking about natural disasters, um, the sacks and military disasters, human imposed disasters, generally also don't suffice to make ruins, or permanent ruins. It's only when a, a kind of occasion like that uh, happens to work in combination with the sort of secular trends towards depopulation. Um, so you could, you could think of these disasters as offering, offering permission to make ruins or offering people an occasion to abandon a site or offering uh, elites an occasion to drive people away from a site. Um, but the disaster itself doesn't really do anything. It's kind of a concurrent cause. It's not a, not a sufficient cause. Well, let me ask you a question to sort of wrap things up, to pull things together. We're getting close to the end of our time. One of the most impressive things about your book is its tremendous range. You go from uh, Sardis to uh, Tenochtitlan, from the Eastern Mediterranean across the Atlantic to the New World. And so do you see certain, certain strands that, that certain continuities, you might say, that in, in the way that ruins are conceived of? or is there a real transformation uh, in the way that, 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 that people uh, uh, process or deal with or use uh, ruins? And, and if so, to the extent that you can, you, can, you can say it, when, where, and why does this take place? Well, I do see that um, this is a feature of the organization of my book, uh, but also a conclusion that I kind, kind of came to, that uh, when one talks about sort of attitudes towards ruins, uh, one's talking about something where there really are these epochal breaks. The, the, the story is not a continuous one. Even in places like uh, Athens and Rome, where there's a pretty strong continuity in the literary tradition and a lot of the, the shared mythology, uh, shared kind of deep historical background, uh, the attitude towards ruins is just completely different. Thinking about the um, role played by Romans, by ruins in, in kind of Roman history as an excuse for people to come to Rome, as an excuse for people to populate Rome. Um, ruins are for Romans kind of 
in the past. There's a very kind of past-oriented view of what ruins are for. Um, important occasions, not for the end of, of a civilization, but for the beginning of Roman civilization. Uh, not a view that the Greeks share um, in the ways that I've been talking about. Their understanding of ruins is very presentist and future-oriented, even though both of them are very often kind of talking about the ruination of Troy. They're talking about the same historical moment. Um, if you think it's historical, they're talking about the same literary tradition, um, same uh, literary tradition about the, the ruination of Troy. And a lot of the same even names and figures showing up in, in both, um, both stories. Um, ruins are, I think an object of thought, but also increasingly a um, way that societies kind of self-conceptualize their own unity vis-a-vis -vis an outsider, vis-a-vis -vis a particular past. Um, and as such, they're called to use in a wide range of ways um, that correspond to particular kind of conjunctural social, social formations. Uh, and for that reason, um, I think that diversity is kind of the keynote here. Um, all the various kind of complexities and structures that, that hold a social unit together um, work together to formulate a kind of a unique past for it and ruins are, are part of that uh, unique past. Uh, there is not a great deal of continuity when we're talking about the past of the past, but rather these radical breaks. Um, where I do think that there is a kind of a, a thread tying all of this stuff together is that earlier views of, about ruins are the object of reception, creative reception by um, later societies who are working with perhaps the buildings themselves, but certainly the literary texts, the, the textual traces. Uh, so the Roman reception of the destruction of Troy would be one instance of that. Um, the Renaissance reception of uh, Roman imperial ruin making is another example. And I think that that is uh, an important piece of reception for understanding um, what eventually happens to Tenochtitlan, um, as well as kind of the run up to that. Um, I think it's no coincidence that uh, Tenochtitlan is being destroyed at the same moment as Machiavelli is, is um, writing about the Romans, that uh, their history shows that you either have to destroy a place to hold it if it's accustomed to living under its own laws, or you have to colonize it and invade it yourself. Um, and Cortez ends up uh, doing both. Uh, but I think that, that his choice, his eventual choice of that option is, is justified for him on grounds that um, come out of the same moment of reception as produce uh, Machiavelli's uh, words in The Prince about the importance of making ruins to uh, creating an empire. The instrumentalization of ruin making as part of uh, this imperial project. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Martin. It's been really a pleasure to uh, get to speak with you once again. That's uh, Professor Martin DeVecca, and the book is Broken Cities, a Historical Sociology of Ruins, and you can uh, read the chapter uh, Athens on the Mediterranean Seminar uh, website if you go to the Articles of the Month uh, section. So thank you again, Martin. It's been a real pleasure talking thank to you. Thank you. And uh, uh, we'll look forward to, uh, to your next project. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sharon. Bye.